As we've said previously, we actually love having speakers with uh, with actually this strength of energy, whose presentations are always visually stimulating, packed with concrete examples and infused with it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming on stage Mr. David Rowan. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you, Emma. I spend my time meeting, as you said, the crazy ones, the people who have their own scientific magic where they turn a mad idea plus somebody else's money either into a scalable business or to philanthropy. I work with a lot of startups. I've currently invested in 40 startups, some of them using material science as one of them that's growing bone in a lab. Um, because the great thing about startups is they are risk-taking machines that can try and solve some of the bigger problems that very successful, profitable, bigger companies find it hard to make work. And I'm going to talk today about what's happening in the startup side of material science, but also how we can learn from the way these companies think. So Wired Magazine, which I launched as editor-in-chief um, eight years ago, is about where the future is coming. And it's not just tech or science, because the future comes when trends collide, where human behavior and design meet a new technology, where architecture makes the most of new scientific approaches to ventilation. And I see a lot of stuff that is kind of blowing my mind, and I see enough that I don't get bored. Last week I was in Zurich at the Technical University, and at ETH, the Tech University, they're making drones, they're making robots, and they're also making exoskeletons. And they are building companies out of the lab that will help you walk when you're older, but also for now for people who are paralyzed. They even have an Olympics, they call it the Cybathlon, to get competition going between people making exoskeletons. When I was there, I also went into a wheelchair that can climb upstairs. So we've now reached the stage where good design plus lower cost motor parts mean you can create new products to market. And at the time I was there, I saw an announcement that this company that makes flying cars just got another $90 million funding. It's called Lilium, vertical takeoff electric jet-powered car. It's a German company. They are taking what was science fiction into just another consumer product. And they're not the only one. There's a company also in Germany called Volocopter that's planning to put this to market within the next year for about 300,000 euros. So we've gone from the idea of the drone that's something you play with to the drone that can carry you to the airport in maybe eight minutes, and people are building businesses on these things. So just think of how quickly in the drone space we've gone from you need to be a government to have a drone, tens of millions of dollars, to, well, there's all sorts of companies coming up with new ways to use them. This is a company called ProDrone. This is either the way to take your children to school or for people who want to abduct children from the playground to get access to them. It's kind of weird, but nobody controls it because innovation at the edge, because materials are accessible, there's a lot of open source ideas being spread. You don't need factories. You can rent space in other people's factories. You don't need funding. You can go to the crowdfunding websites. There's a huge democratization happening. So we talk a lot about robotics, and at the high end, of course, there are these companies. This is Boston Dynamics that SoftBank just bought from Google. They started out making robots for the battlefield, for the military. They're now making robots for the warehouse, but also for your home. But as well as the big, well-funded companies, there are innovations happening at the edge. The people that make the Vespa motorbike, Piaggio, have just invented the robot suitcase. So the idea is this will follow you 
around the airport when you're going on your summer vacation. I can't promise you this is the future. But what's interesting is there are thousands of attempts to build the future. And if you like it, and if it solves a problem, a real problem, then it may work. So in manufacturing, things are getting very interesting. So the new processes we have to make things, this gentleman in the space station needed a wrench. So it was emailed to him as an attachment and then printed on site in the 3D printer made by a startup called Made in Space. So all this is telling me, we are in a time of everything getting faster. And even if you have a very successful petrochemical business, even if you have a lab that is dominating the world in one approach to polymer science, you can't really afford to relax because we all risk getting left behind. Just looking at the investment going into startups in material sciences, there's a website called AngelList where early stage investors list the companies they're putting money into. This is the material science page I looked at last night. So they've got 193 companies doing everything from nanotechnology for car windshields to a data platform for new kind of materials. And I'll share some things I'm seeing with some of these emerging companies. Um, this is just one of those examples. It's using synthetic biology to turn methane into new kind of chemicals. Now, synthetic biology, we're going to hear a lot more about. Often it's called synth bio. It's when you take biology and you add engineering and you let nature help build new kind of products. And I'll just read you something from, there's a, a, a journal called Synthetic Biology. The editor, Jean Picou, just said, cyber biological systems, that's connecting biology to the network, cyber biological systems could catalyze the fifth industrial revolution in the second half of the 20th century. So there's a whole bunch of companies like this. Um, this is Soul Gear. This is another of those companies making bioplastics from plant sources. This is a company that just got a lot of funding from MIT. They have a new fund, it's called The Engine, and they announced this week seven of the companies that are getting them. Um, this company, Via Separations, is taking on industrial separation. They're using graphene oxide molecular filtration membranes, which they say are more effective, more resilient than polymers. So they're replacing the whole process of thermal separation in manufacture. They're starting with the food industry, then they're looking at pharma. And they say this can cut energy use by about 90%. And they've got a really good problem to solve because about 15% of energy use in the US comes from thermal separation processes. That kind of compares with the energy use from internal combustion engines. And there's companies using kind of natural processes to create new kind of materials. We did a story in Wired about this company called Ecovative, which is using mushroom, fungus, to create new fibrous packaging materials. And it's rolling out into all sorts of use cases. It grows quickly, it's cheap, it's natural. It's easy to recycle. It also gave us the best headline for Wired when we did this story. We asked the team if they would grow a headline using fungus. Nanotech, for instance, is coming out of the lab into the startups in very interesting ways. Um, what's the biggest problem we as a civilization face today? It's our mobile phones not lasting to the evening. The battery goes, right? So there's a company in Tel Aviv called Storedot that's just raised, I think, $130 million that's trying to solve this by having a hybrid team of physicists, nanotech scientists, biologists, data scientists, and they're taking novel approaches to creating batteries. This is one of their demonstrations of charging one of their na nano batteries in 40 seconds. They're also saying they can do a car battery in five minutes. And it doesn't surprise you that they've taken funding from people who have things to lose if they get left behind. 
One of their big funders was Samsung, not because it wanted the batteries to explode, but because it knows that its own teams don't have this hybrid approach. And what's happening in batteries is happening into 3D printing. There's a whole bunch of companies now making very, very intricate metals, among other things. And the price of the machinery is coming down and the access to them is growing. Just think of where 3D printing is starting to affect things like fashion. Light, super flexible, highly durable, and printed straight from liquid. A marvel of design and function, this shoe defies logic. And whether you want to make one or one million, this is true, customizable, and on-demand mass manufacturing. So this is a company called Carbon that uses a liquid process to replace the laser sintering, and it says it can produce flexible, detailed objects in a fraction, maybe a hundredth of the time of conventional models. And then you see what's happening with synthetic biology in fashion. Um, we heard earlier about the, the properties of silk. Um, what if you can use synth bio to create new kind of silk? Well, there's a company called Bolt Threads. Here at Bolt Threads, we've developed a way to replicate the proteins from spider silk and spin them into fibers and yarns. We're using these yarns to develop sustainable, high-performance fabrics for the future. That's silk from spiders being made by a startup that's pretty well funded, that has a decent chance it will make it. And everywhere there is innovation happening. A company called Biomason that is growing bricks using bacteria at the site of the building. So you don't have to truck bricks across the country. The bacteria harden the material. It's a company in China I met in June, it's called Royal, making new kind of very, very thin, flexible, brilliant color displays. Your screen need not be something flat. Your screen can be something curved that you can put in your pocket that you can do anything with. Because these are people from outside the system that are experimenting that are iterating. If you think about energy, what's happening now is the price of solar energy is tumbling, and there are experiments with things like the use of perovskite, a mineral, to create a layer on solar panels that makes them much more efficient, maybe cut inefficiency by a quarter. And there's a whole bunch of companies like this, Sol Technologies, that are using perovskite to try and create a low-cost, highly efficient way to boost the attractiveness of solar energy. So what's underlying all of this is the exponential curve that we got used to with Moore's Law that's cutting prices, that's raising access, and that's creating a networked effect that can scale technology. So we know about Moore's law, something that was expensive, like computer storage, goes down to zero. Um, we're seeing those exponential curves now hitting all sorts of industries. Um, the falling cost of sequencing human DNA, this is a logarithmic scale, so the green curve is falling more quickly than the Moore's law curve. Something that 16 years ago cost $100 million dollars, to sequence a person now costs a couple of hundred dollars, soon it will be the price of a cup of coffee. This changes the way you discover drugs, the way you treat people. But it's also hitting, well, this is the price of solar energy. Many countries now can produce solar more cheaply than fossil-based fuels. And um, what happens to the utilities businesses in those companies, in those countries? They have to start thinking nimbly about where things are going. Think how much we're already starting to take for granted the ability to talk to the network. This is a problem that's only just been solved. In 1994, Microsoft set itself the challenge in its labs of creating a machine that could listen to voice and understand it. The first year, 100% failure rate. 2013, about a quarter accurate. Earlier this year, they said they had reached the same level as humans suddenly you have a new mainstream. And think of artificial intelligence and where that's going, how quickly it's dominating all sorts of sectors. Earlier this year, as one example, 
the chip company NVIDIA presented at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas its vision of how your car will intelligently drive you pretty soon. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. So get this right, your car is now lip reading you to drive you autonomously to the place. Um, the machine is now able to know your emotion. Companies like Sitecore by scanning human faces. This is telling you, as well as the demographics of these individuals, p percentage of sadness, of anger, of contentedness as they're walking along. And of course, it's hitting business in a big way. Um, just one example of what's happening in finance. This is the homepage of a bank, HSBC, that's been annotated by CB Insights to show all the startups trying to take bits of business based on all the links on the homepage. You know, there are startups taking insurance, foreign currency transaction. Every industry is now facing a similar kind of home page. That's why Mr. Bezos talks about Amazon needing to remain on day one. He talks about day one, his building is called day one. Um, after you start to think we've got past that, we can now relax. He says that's when you start to decline. And of course, some companies had brilliant day ones and day twos and day threes, and then things went wrong. His company started growing in the 1860s. It was making rubber, and then it kind of built a paper-making business. And then by the mid-20th century, it starts to get into electronic components, and by the late 20th century, it was making very small electronic products and dominated the world and thought, we've got there. Dangerous mindset. Because a technology can come from one field and touch business in another field. CRISPR, the gene editing technology, it's about four years old. How could that potentially affect the supermarket business? Well, maybe if we can learn how to edit salad crops and maybe grow them at home in controlled environments, maybe we won't need to go to the supermarket to buy them. So I'm going to give you very quickly half a dozen ways the startups are thinking that I think you might start to bear in mind in your job because not all startups work, most of them fail. But it's that resilience, that determination that can build game changers. And the first lesson I see in the startups I work with is if something doesn't work, they accept it and move on. You may play a game produced by a company in Finland called Supercell. Um, this is the boss of Supercell, Ilka Panonen. He wants to be the world's least powerful CEO, he says, because he wants to delegate decision-making to the teams, small teams, cells of 15 people. And he encourages them to experiment constantly with new characters, with new game narratives. And if they spend a bit of money and time making something and then realize it's just not working when they test it, they bring the, f the whole company together and they toast with champagne the fact that it failed, but they learn from it. So there are posters like these inside Facebook. This is how they're trying to build up resilience and hacking as a mindset. At the same time, a lot of these companies differentiate themselves by working out how they can extract data from what they do to give them a massive advantage. Um, I'll give you just an example of how data can help people who bet on the stock market on retail stocks. Because there's a company, a startup called Orbital Insight that uses satellite imagery plus its own algorithms to count motor cars parked outside retail stores, and it compares the number of cars outside Ikea or Walmart with similar size stores, this time last month, this time last week. And it sells the data to investors because they found out that they can correlate in advance what the stores are going to say is their performance with how many cars there are. Um, the American supermarket chain, or 
retail chain, J.C. Penney, has had a very bad year. Orbital Insight showed that its car count preceded the announcement and the share price very, very neatly. So you can make a nice financial bet. And everything is data. Every sector, even the most unlikely, companies are turning themselves into data machines. The startup I got to meet recently that's turning wine into data by creating wine, having reverse engineered the molecular science of what's in the wine. This is a company in San Francisco called Ava Winery. This is the founding team. They are making wine without grapes. Their mission is to make Dom Perignon available to everyone, but also climate change may make it hard to grow grapes. So how do we use our knowledge of the molecules in the gas, the taste, the thickness, the mouthfeel? So they're reverse engineering different qualities of wine in their lab to try and solve this problem. Crazy idea. They've received $3 million in VC funding. It may not work, but it's pushing knowledge forward. But if it goes wrong, one of the qualities of the best startups is they can change direction without giving up completely. Um, they talk about the pivot, which is something that you see in a basketball. If the guy can't get through that way, he moves this way. And it's about reframing where you see the value of your business. And conventional established companies can do this too. There's a bookshop that's been in a very expensive part of Mayfair in London since the 1930s that is not in a happy place selling books. Not a good business to be in, especially if you're paying high rent. So it's pivoted. It's thought maybe our knowledge, our skill is not in selling books, maybe it's in curating collections of books. So they're now making bespoke libraries for their customers. They recently did a 3,000 book library for a high net worth Swiss individual and they charged 500,000 pounds. That's a nice pivot. Australian airline Qantas, again in a very, very challenged business space. So they've realized maybe the value is not the airline as much as the airline loyalty program, which has half of the Australian population and they use it for all sorts of other things. It's like a second currency. So they're building on top of it insurance businesses, a life insurance business, a health insurance business, which are very profitable. It's kind of pivoting, but working out how to reframe the value. Again, I see this in lots of places. In China, the 50-year-old car parts company, very big company called Wang Xiang, commodity business making hardware. So it's decided to become the data layer of the city of the future. It's spent $30 billion building a connected city near Hangzhou so it can track what's happening as autonomous cars get to use the city. And it's storing the data on the blockchain and it thinks if it owns the knowledge of data, that's probably more valuable long term than making car parts. A couple more. The best way to innovate, everybody's looking for this thing called innovation, is to bring together people who think in different ways, who have different backgrounds. There's a new building that's just opened next to St. Pancras Station in London. It's a life sciences building. It's called the Crick Institute. It's there to try and solve cancer, genomic diseases. And what's beautiful is it was funded by the Cancer Research Charity plus the Wellcome Trust, and they wanted no walls on the inside because they wanted the biologist to run in to the data scientist, to the chemist, because they think... It, you know, if we take new approaches, if we spark new conversations, this could well deliver results. So Jeffrey Immelt struggled when he was running GE. How can you modernize a legacy company more than a century old, 300,000 people? So he worked with startups. There's a startup called Local Motors that allows the crowd to design, to design cars, and then they 3D print the body of the car. GE partnered with Local Motors, and they built these hacker spaces. This one is first built in St. Louis. So anybody can come in off the street and prototype new kind of products quickly, cheaply, the lean startup approach, and GE could learn from those different approaches. Another way is to assume that maybe your business isn't in 
isolation. Maybe you need to find a way to work with other sorts of businesses that can grow on top of yours, turn yours into a platform. I, in Beijing, um, wrote a story about this man called Lei Jun, who runs a company that makes very cool high-end phones called Xiaomi. And they're often accused of being rip-offs of Apple phones. He's even gone on stage and done the Steve Jobs one more thing, and that didn't go down well. Um, but he makes no margin on the phones. They make all their money out of accessories. And I'm not going to make any judgments on what the Xiaomi accessory store looks like, but the best-selling air purifier in China is a Xiaomi one. The best-selling battery pack is a Xiaomi one. But they don't own the companies that make this. They've just invested a small amount of money in 76 companies that make the hardware. $100,000 they'll invest. And I asked the guy running this team why you don't invest directly. He said, we're 8,000 people. If we were investing in our own people, we'd have 20,000 people. We'd never make decisions. Plus, these guys have to survive every day on the streets. They need to know what the customer wants today, not yesterday. We'd rather have them carry that risk. We put him on the cover of Wired saying it's time to copy China. And, and finally, it's about creating a culture in your organization. So this woman is called Whitney Wolf. She worked at a startup incubator called Hatch Labs. They brought together a team of 20-somethings to prototype new kind of apps, new kind of products. And they took investment from the company that owned, I think, the biggest dating site at the time, the interactive corporation owned Match.com. And they gave Hatch Labs some workspace just opposite Match.com, but they kept the culture as a hacker space. Guess what they invented? Tinder which then became much bigger than the incumbent Match.com. So how do you collide, get new cultures in? So the real dinosaur institution that I know is the Natural History Museum, old Victorian academic organization. They put on their board a private equity guy, Simon Patterson, who works for the company that bought Skype for $2 billion and sold it the next year for $5 billion. He's treating it as a turnover. He's bringing in people from Amazon, people from media companies, to try and change the culture of this institution. And I'm going to leave you with one risk factor, one warning, which is the thing not to do. Thinking that because things were, they will be. So in 2004... Fortune put on the cover um, two guys running a fast-growing company called Skype, and they quoted inside the magazine the head of tech for a big phone company, AT&T. He said, well, what Skype's doing is like a toy. They'll never get anywhere. It's kind of dangerous. Six years later, the New York Times did a piece about this fast-growing company called Netflix, and they quoted the head of a big media company, Time Warner. They quoted Jeff Bukes, Who's, like, is the Albanian army going to take over the world? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I will leave you with something that happened 10 years ago when another company that made smartphones, their boss, their CEO, was asked on television whether he saw this new thing called the iPhone as a threat, and he laughed. <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft? Thank you for listening. <laughs>